And well, as, as I looked at what we would be doing in Bible study, I thought I would love to do a survey of the Old Testament, and then we will, that's the three books. So one book is uh, Holy Scripture, obviously, and, uh, and uh, uh, Mike Holy is on my case this morning because we're not going to be studying Isaiah. <laughs> See if we were get good at it. Um, this, this addendum is a piece that I wrote about four years ago. Uh, and I have been increasing, I, I guess, on the one hand, uh, and this is not, um, uh, I think, uh, say too much about myself, but I've probably been about as faithful to our blessed Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, as a pastor can be. But there has been for me for a long time uh, uh, disappointment in the way that we uh, practice uh, Holy Communion. Not with the way we do it in the liturgy, but the way that we practice it over against non uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans. And so I did a study probably of about a couple of years and uh, I found out that we were misinterpreting <coughs> chapter 11, and we could do that another time, we won't this morning. But in chapter 11, where St. Paul gives us the definitive doctrinal setting uh, for the practice of Holy Communion and found out that we are misinterpreting, misinterpreting, uh, some words called the body of Christ in chapter 11. Uh, that same word and that same meaning in chapter 12, there are 17 times that the word body of Christ is used and uh, has a meaning that St. Paul intended. At any rate, so, uh, in, in writing this paper, it's about 30 pages, and it's found all over Senate today. Um, uh, uh, this is a setting for the Lord's Supper that we would all recognize, and although we may vary from time to time in our worship services on Communion Sundays, it is going to follow this same outline all the time. What I found out was, over a period of time, that most Missouri Synod people do not understand or know that this is the presentation and the outline of our Lord Jesus Christ's life. And so if you go through the liturgy, we are going to read the story of Jesus. We're going to sing the story of Jesus. We're going to share the story of Jesus. And I hope that comes through as a we go through this this morning. Let's begin the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, you give us this precious, precious book, the Lutheran hymnal. Not that Lutheran necessarily has to go along with it, but it is a hymnal which is faithful to century upon century of your churches, practice and deep enjoyment and, uh, and uh, gift of the Holy Communion service. So grant us this morning as we study this, uh, 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 again, a joy, a new satisfaction, and the comfort and the gift that uh, our Holy Communion practice, the way we do it in our hymnals, and the way we practice it in our daily lives, that this might again feed us this day with your grace and goodness. In the name of Jesus, amen. First, and this is going to go through, <coughs> excuse me, again, page 151. But then, now, if you've been in the Lutheran Church for long enough, uh, you know that this uh, setting one is a little bit different from the setting that we grew up with. Uh, if it wasn't page five and wasn't page 15, it wasn't really right, right? Um, and, uh, and, and by the time you and I were in eighth grade, Dave, we didn't even need a 
and so on. We try, we need it, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, but now we have five settings in here, and each of them has its own distinct use, and each of them is really, really good. Uh, setting three is the one that we grew up with. But now, that first paragraph, just an introduction, <coughs> excuse me, to worship in general, um, and to, um, in this case, page 15, or page 151, divine service setting one. Uh, and this that you have is a piece that goes in the 30 page uh, um, uh, study of the practice of Holy Communion in the scriptures according to St. Paul. Uh, and I wanted this in there so that uh, we could see that as a visitor comes into our worship services and worships with us in, in the, the Holy Communion setting, whether it's the one we've got here, 151, or any of the other four, that they could read and know and experience with their fellow worshipers the story of Jesus, which is what page five, or page 15 and our hymnal is. Finally, this is toward the end of the uh, piece I wrote, the critique of our community practice. Finally, there is at least one more presence of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is what St. Paul refers to in chapter 11 uh, of 1 Corinthians, in which he talks about the Holy Communion and the presence of the body of Christ. Finally, there is at least one more presence of the body of Christ that must be recognized if our discernment, our understanding, what we understand St. Paul is saying, more importantly, what the Holy Spirit gives St. Paul to be saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, if our discernment is to be somewhat near, clear, and complete, the body of Christ in the sacred liturgy itself, centuries of piety, practice, art, and drama have provided for our generations a presence of Christ that may be either known or unnoticed as the story of Jesus which is what page 15 is, which is what page 191 is, which each of our communion setting is. Um, the presence of Christ that may be either unknown or unnoticed as the story of Jesus unfolds in the Holy Eucharist narrative of the presence of the body of Christ. The British playwright J.R.R. Tolkien in his Lord of the Rings and Hobbit legends creates a conversation between a hobbit and a great tree of the forest. The hobbit, standing all of three feet tall, stands beneath this forest lord and demands to know his name. What is your name? The little hobbit says. As Tolkien imagines it, the tree shakes its massive limbs, looks down upon the little creature, and proclaims softly, I cannot tell you my name. If you would know my name, you must first of all know my story. My story is very old, very beautiful, and set in a great mystery. If you will be seated and listen, I will begin to tell you my story, and perhaps then you will come to know the beauty and wonder of my name. Tolkien could well be describing the great communion liturgy of the church and the body of Christ. It both reveals and creates, and I love the way I've described it. I don't like many things I do, but this is not. <laughs> The body of Christ both reveals and creates that the communion and our liturgy, our liturgy is very old, very beautiful, and set in a great mystery. Right? All right, preparation as the service begins, the liturgist steps before the congregation to introduce the story that the body of Christ will celebrate and share this Lord's day, setting the table for the sacrament. Now, 
But this is relatively new. When I first started a hundred years ago, uh, we just came in and we sang that opening hymn and the pastor didn't say anything and we all knew exactly where we were and we didn't even need the hymn. It just remained in the pew because by the time we were confirmed, we pretty much knew that liturgy backwards and forwards. Which is probably one of the reasons that we fail to recognize that it is in fact the liturgy is the story of Jesus. <coughs> with me each and every Sunday. <clears throat> As the service begins, the liturgist now steps before the congregation to introduce the story that the body of Christ will celebrate and share this Lord's Day, setting the table for the sacrament. Now, some pastors will absolutely refuse to say anything because if you're not speaking the Holy Communion, you're not, you're not really honoring the sacrament. Um, that's, I don't know what percentage that would be, but there is a strong feeling that you need, don't need to say anything, in fact, you must not say anything. And so it just starts off, people stand, they know to stand, and you have the opening hymn, they know where the opening hymn is supposed to be. Uh, <coughs> and, and the liturgy could go on whether or not there was one person in church. Okay, then we're going to go through it. But regardless, um, and, uh, and the pastor will welcome the visitors in the name of Jesus, and then very briefly, but very clearly, present the themes of Scripture, sermon, song, and sacrament for this day. I believe that this simply engages people in the uh, worship for the day very quickly as, as they prepare for. Uh, the, the service and the story of Jesus. <clears throat> uh, and then very briefly, but very clearly, present the themes of Scripture, service, song, and sacrament for this day. The liturgist may also invite the congregation to pray with them on mission prayer. Learn this probably, I guess, about 30 years ago, as one of the finest pastors I've ever known. His dad was president of Concordia uh, River Forest for a year. But he always started every one of his liturgies, every one of his services, with a mission prayer. Because he said, this is why we're here. We're not here just for our own sake. We are here to pray for the world, to pray for this church, and to let one another know that we're not here either to be entertained or simply go through the rubric but we are here to offer our prayers, our hymns, our songs to God on behalf of the world, okay? Not just us. Uh, and, and that just made so much sense to me that this is why we are here, not simply for our own sake. We are here because we are offering our hymns and our prayers and our love to our Heavenly Father our Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit on behalf of all of those who don't even know he exists, right? The question I always get asked in confirmation, but how about those who never heard the word of Jesus? You know? That's part of our prayer. That's part of our prayer. Uh, uh, so in any way, we may use a mission prayer which now to the worship folder. The mission prayer reminds the members and assures the guests that we are gathered not simply to personal or for personal blessing or benefits, but to pray and prepare for the mission the Spirit gives us in, in this new week. The prayer will ordinarily be church year in organ orientation, following is a simple model for the season of Pentecost, and this is one of the prayers that we have used here uh, since I've been pastor here, and you know them probably at this point well, down to the invocation. I'm saying don't get too cold. Uh, the invocation, as the processional hymn closes, in, in Sebastian, you teach us so well as you bear that processional cross and we're blessed.
by the way, your training, dude, you're there doing a good job. They're taking your job away from you. <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, as the processional hymn closes, the congregation enters into the liturgy and re enters as a scattered, broken body into the body of Christ, into whose death and resurrection we are baptized. We're coming from all over with all the heartaches, with all the pains, with all the needs, uh, with all the good things as well. But we come as a broken community together, okay? Uh, and so the first thing we do is take the name of the one who baptized us and in whose name we live. Um, uh, the congregation enters into the liturgy and we enter as a scattered, broken body into the body of Christ, into whose death and resurrection we are baptized. And as the sign of the cross is signed on the hidden heart, we proclaim together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to read. Question, confession, and absolute thoughts. Question, tonight. Pretty obvious. The confession and absolution. The congregation is now invited to recognize, to discern the body of Christ in all of its personal and corporal brokenness and divisiveness, as together we confess our sins against God, our neighbor, all creation, and finally even ourselves, and together seek his forgiveness. Well, some weeks I come to confession as a Boy, do I need that this week. I said, no, I'm pretty good this week. And, and, and it doesn't make any difference because I come as a broken human being along with you. And at this point, we hear the promise and we experience Jesus' healing, the forgiveness of sins, and the gathering of this body of Christ into a unity which only God can give. As the liturgy leads us, what, no, 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 I'm going to put you here. Uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, yeah, uh, under the confession and absolution. Uh, the, the best confession, and I still use it, is the one that I memorize and fall back on. Remember, <coughs> Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a uh, poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee of all men. Today we use a variety of confessions. It has some pluses and it has some minuses. I think we always need to come back to these words, I, a poor, miserable sinner, because in an age in which we are told again and again, we need to we need to feel good about ourselves, okay? We need to feel good about ourselves. And that's right. At the same time, we need to be honest. And so I, a poor, miserable sinner, describes me perfectly and give your forgiveness to me, a poor, sinful being, right? That's the one that, that uh, is the most ancient and the one that is most often used. The words of the confession, again, under the confession of absolution, the words of the confession are scarcely out of our mouths when the broken body becomes one body. We're coming from many separate places, we're coming with so many different experiences of this week, and we are we are divisive, we are broken, and now in the words of God's forgiveness, we become one body and the greater word of absolution and reconciliation in Jesus. I forgive you all your sins. Now there is even when we're unhappy with some of the other people in this sanctuary, we are still one body. <coughs> Excuse me, I didn't say that, but I didn't create it. But the one who alone can bring all things together, our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our body is together once again. The curious. Okay, let's go over to the next page, page 152. Here we are. Um, and uh, this is the Kyrie according to uh, uh, setting one. 
in peace let us pray to the Lord. Uh, and the Kyrie, it, it, I always thought when I was growing up and memorized this because it would say, Lord have mercy, don't hit me again. <laughs> right? Lord have mercy, be kind to me. I, I just got started, I just got your forgiveness, and now I'm singing once again, Lord have mercy. And I'm, you know, most people won't realize this is a shout of joy. It comes out of the earliest days of the church and probably was the first piece of liturgy that was sung or prayed every time we came to the Lord's Supper. Because in the Greek, Kyrie is Lord. Eleazar means have mercy. But what it really means is it's like whistling through your teeth, it's like applause, it's like alleluia, uh, and it was what the ancient Greeks would sing or say as an Olympic hero, uh, Olympic hero commanded it down, Olympic athlete, or when the king, or any kind of local dignitary, they would stand on the side of the road, and they would shout out, carry Eliana, carry Eliana. And what it said, in effect, was, uh, thank you for being here, we know, that you are here for us. We know that you are a good ruler. We know, etc. Et so it is a cry of, 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 of joy and of comfort and of consolation. It doesn't sound like that because, again, uh, Lord have mercy sounds like we're pleading for, for something or other because I'm. Uh, uh, and in fact, it is a cry of joy, a cry of affirmation of hallelujah. Let's say we whistle through our teeth or we applaud or whatever it might be. The early Greeks would say, Kyrie eleison. And so that found its way into the liturgy very early because the early church understood there was nobody and no one that deserve this Kyrie liaison more than our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Kyrie is Lord, and why Kyrie is uh, a cry of God. Well, the way I've got it written here, Kyrie immediately, the body's sacred narrative begins in earnest as the separate voices sing together in reconciliation, recognition, and celebration of the Lord as he strides bearing peace and power down the main street of history and the main aisle of our sanctuary. <laughs> That's what we're doing at this point, that, that Christ is one with us and he is among us. The main streets of history and the main aisles of our sanctuary, we shout and sing in jubilation, carry as the Lord have mercy. And that's probably the point at which it is so easy to understand, to misunderstand our liturgy. But this is a recognition after the confession and absolution, after the forgiveness of sins, and we, our Lord comes with that forgiveness, and we shout out, Kyrie eleison! Thank God you're here. Here you are, Lord. But anybody ever think that sounded kind of like it was a cry for mercy? <laughs> Which is what it is, but it's it's joy, and that's the point particularly that we recognize that Jesus is present in this sacrament, in this service, in this communion. Now the glory in excelsis, <coughs> which always follows. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. <coughs> the glory in the show, glory to God in the highest. But the body of Christ, together now, finds its way home as the hymn of the angels leads us in the Christmas glory and excelsis. And I just said that coming home. We know who we are, we know where we are, we are the song of the angels. We join in the hymn of the angels and into the birth narrative of our Lord Jesus. Thoughts? 
So the story of Jesus continues now in this liturgy. And then with the calling, we will get through. We've sung glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the glory of the Joseph. Now the calling that follows our brief Christmas celebration gathers not simply the body of Christ's petition in the moment, but gathers the calls of congregations over the ages, teaching the body to continue in prayer. And these precious prayer boys, they call hand me downs. Uh, many of these collects go all the way back to the, to the uh, well, probably some of the oldest go back to about the year 1000, about the year 900. And so if these collects sometimes seem a little awkward uh, and don't sound the way we might pray today, it's because they are. They're simply translated, uh, usually from the Greek or it could be from the Latin. But I'd like to refer to them as hand me down. They're, they're a precious little gift of the early church when she gives to it. And so when we pray these calling, sometimes I'll be tempted to just change them a little bit so they sound more uh, immediate, you know, more, <coughs> excuse me, more the way we would talk. I'm tempted, but I try not to be tempted. So if they seem a little awkward from time to time, it's because the translations are good, but the translations are kind of, uh, uh, again, I guess you would say, just a little bit awkward. They've been around a long time. Okay? Now, the scripture lessons. As the body is joined together in prayer and praise, the promise of growing deeper into the story continues to gather the attention of the worshipers as the ancient prophecies of the Old Testament are read and heard and the exciting narrative of the earliest days of the infant church are remembered in the letters of Peter, Paul, and other first century body of Christ witnesses. And I've mentioned several times here, I know, and it came as kind of a shock to me that in the old hymnal, the 1941 hymnal, <coughs> the red one, the real one, yeah. <laughs> I, I was invited to preach at a church, this beautiful, beautiful, big rural church in Nebraska, and the district president asked me if I could come up and preach for their mission. I said, so I was district president. I said, I don't go to other districts to pray to to uh, preach at mission festivals. And he said, Yeah, but this church is the best giving church to mission in the whole Nebraska district. I said, okay. <laughs> and so anyway, the king was in the fall, and every man that came in had either a red hat, or a red jacket, or red pants, or a big red tie that had, yeah, Nebraska on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was wonderful. So wonderful. did you forgive him? So, I, I went, so did you forgive them for wearing red? Well, what I told them was that I, that you need to know that in Kansas, big red stands for the old hymn. <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't, they wouldn't give me any apartment for that. <laughs> but it was just so, so, so wonderful. Uh, anyway, the uh, Old Testament is read now middle of the scripture lessons as the liturgy leads us through the epistle into the continuing Jesus story of the early church's mission we now prepare for the heightened presence of Christ himself in the holy gospel and so the body of Christ rises and inhales into itself the very word that gives it identity and life and on the one hand I know that from time to time our minds will drift a little bit as we're listening to the lesson. That's one of the reasons why Pastor Stephen and I started doing a Zoom series on, or not a Zoom series, but, but a, a, a series on the lessons. So uh, 
Uh, we haven't done that because since I've been over here, it's been just too difficult. Um, but I, in fact, I looked up, I wanted to find the history of um, the lesson, make sure that I had the dates and the times right when uh, the new series, the new reading series that we use, when it came into existence and how it came into existence. And it's amazing what you can find on the internet. And so I looked at it, and I, I went on down, all of a sudden my name was there. And so was Pastor Stephen, because they were advertising on the internet the fact that Pastor Stephen and I had, with each week, uh, um, a study of the three lessons for each of the And I was just so impressed. And, and, so I told Steve, I called him right away, he said, no, you're a liar. No, I no, I'm not. The scripture lessons. Then the creed. The body pauses for a moment as it prepares to gather the faith of centuries into its corporate mind and spirit. The faith of thousands of years, millions of saints, and hundreds of body of Christ decorations. That is, this is not the only one, but these three, the Apostles, Athanasian, and Nicene Creed, are the three ecumenical creeds that uh, most, most pastors in the church uh, confess and uh, becomes the center of their, of their life and their preaching and theology and so on. And then in high confidence, the body confesses Jesus Christ is Lord. And the pause, the common declaration of the I believe begins. And if our hearts and eyes are open in this moment, we are pleased to discern, to recognize that in this common confession, the body of Christ is one in the great cradle, the great I believe of Christianity. Pause. Pastor, I have a question going back to the scripture lessons. Um, when we say that we prepare for the heightened presence of Christ Himself, That's right. when we say that we prepare for the heightened presence of Christ Himself in the Holy Gospel, yeah. um, I was wondering if more reformed versions of Christianity could be, be if more reformed versions of Christianity, farther than Lutherans, right. believe in a holy presence of Jesus during the sermon, since they don't believe in the Yeah, that's a good and question. Him. And I think, and it's, it's kind, of, kind of a guess, kind of a hunch, but probably more than that. Those denominations for those uh, Christian churches that have a deep sense of Christ's presence in the sacrament, you know, that Christ is truly present, uh, under bread and wine, also, I think, are more likely to get very excited about the word of Jesus and the gospel. That's why, you know, we stand up. The, not that Peter, what Peter and Paul write is important too, but they don't get, we don't stand up for them. But when Jesus starts talking, he gets our attention. So, again, I, I would guess that those who recognize the presence of Christ under bread and wine would all to also be more aware of the fact that he's present in his word as we read it to God. <coughs> Which is number one, the reason we stand, and also the reason why ordinarily the past will be the gospel. The sermon. At this moment, only one voice speaks for the whole body. And it might have first appeared that the body has become merely an audience somewhat detached from communion unity. However, the appearance is deceiving, for now the Spirit's word, breathed through the homily call, or the homily, calls to an even deeper unity in the body of Christ. The word of law calls us out from our sin-filled separation and crushes the self the self-sufficient, the self-important, the self-centered, and the self-satisfied. The gospel of the cross and resurrection calls us to Christ, who in his embrace of the whole church and his mission to the whole world 
rose again, and anew that in his body, the church, they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. This is, this is really interesting, and sometimes when you're reading the scripture for something, just go to, go to uh, John chapter 17. For in the 17th chapter of John, three times Jesus says that we may be one, that they may be one, that the church may be one, so that they know that you sent me. One of the marks of the presence of Christ is the unity of the church. So the unity of the church is not just a kind of a nice thing to experience, okay? You know, when I say that, I'm not talking about the unity of a congregation, though, as important as that is, but of many denominations, many denominations, and, and recognizing, Jesus says, that in the unity they present, in the unity they express, in the unity which the world sees in Christianity, in that unity, they also see the presence of Christ, so that they may know that um, that I am I am here, and, and of course that means that the 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 distance between denominations and the way we have beaten up on one another and still do, as far as I do, uh, has the the adverse. Uh, word to the world that Christ is somehow other not as present or not present that they may know Jesus says three times in John chapter 17 so the uh, the unity of the church is not simply a nice thing it is in a sense Christ's presence thought Then the words at the top of the page, then the world will know, Jesus says, that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And one of the signs of God's love in the world is the, the uh, how would you say it, is the unity or the common confession of Christian denominations. Um, Then of course, that, that's kind of, yes. Yeah, oh yes, excuse me. Right. Um, I think that is exactly the point where the, our enemy attacks so often. Uh, he, he, finds, he, he finds motives for us to be divisive in, that uh, have nothing to do with uh, the Lord's <coughs> Word. And he also finds things in the Lord's Word that divide us. Uh, just this past week, uh, one of the students in the Missionary Institute, he's a pastor in Panama, and asked to talk with me apart from the, the group. And uh, facing this is your uh, Hebrew class? What's that? This is your Hebrew class? No. Uh, he's, he's taking the basic three courses because they, they want to go on to the seminary. Okay. This is a group that is... Um, was not Lutheran, but had contact with some Lutherans and want to become Lutherans. Well, that's right. Um, but uh, his uh, his father-in-law was one of the founders of the church, and his father-in-law is is thinking that uh, <coughs> that he, the pastor, and the others are are going to hell because they celebrate Christmas. Oh, <laughs> That would be kind of advice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of weird stuff going on. And, you know, that's where the, the enemy attacks. He, he wants to find any any kind of handle that he can. And, uh, you know, we know this here at Ascension, too, because it, it, on a number of occasions, the enemy has, uh, has succeeded in causing divisions and problems amongst us. Yeah. Uh, where and, and some of them maybe 
real problems that we need to address, and some of them have been just, I don't like this. Yeah, and, and we do have those, how would you say, kind of occasional moments when we have a chance to pray with a person of another denomination, or we have prayer for some larger issue. That's precious. When I was, when I was a pastor in Atlanta, one of my best buddies uh, was uh, Father Joe, um, and he was a Roman Catholic priest in St. Peter and Paul, or as Marilyn used to call St. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, <laughs> You had a call. They invited you to preach to teach over there at St. Peter Paul Mary. She said, No, I said, Mary didn't make the cut. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he, he, was, he was a priest there and he was celebrating his 10th anniversary of ordination. He had an earned doctorate from Notre Dame in, of all things, liturgy. Uh, and, and just a great pastor. <laughs> Great priest. And on his 10th anniversary, as a Roman Catholic priest, they have a rather significant celebration of 10 years in the priesthood. And that's a, that's a big deal. And he asked me if I would even celebrate the Mass with him that day, which is probably one of the greatest kinds of compliments you could get. And I had to tell him with tears in my eyes, I can't do that. I would like to. But I will be there in the very front row, and I'll, I'll pray with you, even if I do it quietly. But there, there, there are both those those moments of, of beauty and 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 together, as well as those realities that we face here on earth, um, where uh, our our unity is sometimes more in heart than it is maybe our answer. But at any rate. That anyway, um, that, that again, uh, that the top, that the world may know at the top of the page of Jesus' words that the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And these are my words if the sermon is not the Spirit's preparation of the body gathered this day beneath the cross for our common recognition, remembrance, praise, and proclamation at the Lord's table, this preacher has no business in a Lutheran pulpit. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is because, and, and I know it was the same thing for you, Ray, but that was just, I, hammered is not the right word, because it was a velvet hammer, but but the, the, uh, our cross, especially our hollow edge cross, said, that we always uh, uh, preach the sacrament, you know, when it's, when, it's, when it's offered and so on. And the sacrament may become a central thought or it may become just one thought, but the sacrament of the altar is always present as we preach on a, on a communion Sunday. And the reason that's important is because we're going to have people there who are not Lutheran. Okay. And the question is, uh, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we practice uh, more or less closed with a D communion. Uh, and when I went through the SEM, uh, it was close communion. And most denominations practice something called open communion, where it's a kind of y'all come. Uh, but in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we're very careful of the visitor or the person we don't know and whether or not uh, he or she may commune. My contention throughout this little paper is if they're listening and they're going through this liturgy and they are hearing the Word of God and they are experiencing the prayers of the church and the hymns of the church and the preaching of the church, they should be prepared to come to communion because of who they, they, who they know in this story of Jesus, namely our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Thoughts? Um, and one of my favorite 
expressions I have it tattooed on the top of my head. Unum Predica Sapientia Crucis. That's eight years worth of study right there. Uh, uh, preach only the wisdom of the cross. That's Martin Luther. Unum Predica Sapientia Crucis. Preach only the wisdom of the cross. Now, the body's prayers. Following the congregation's prayers for all sorts and conditions of humanity, we remember and pray also for the members of the body of Christ who cannot be present and include in our prayers preparation for their reception of the sacrament at home. So it's a, it's a special moment, especially if we have a number of shut-ins in the congregation, a number of those who we bring to the age of uh, probably at least monthly. Uh, so we remember them uh, in our prayers at, at, at uh, um, Zion when I first came there. We had about 25 um, shut-ins that I would bring communion to regularly and added to that were five or six from um, Ascension that I, for about, what, about a year, I guess, while we were vacant, that I would do the communions for Ascension as well. Um, and, uh, and we had on the, on the altar in the private communion sets. And so the, the communion was present in the, in the uh, Eucharistic uh, weir on the altar, but it was also present in these uh, smaller um, communion sets for myself or for our elders, uh, who would also bring uh, the sacrament to uh, uh, to our members. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the, the body's prayers, following the congregation's prayers for all sorts of conditions of humanity, we remember and pray also for the members of the body of Christ who cannot be present and include in our prayers preparation for their reception of the sacrament in home communion or in hospital, home, hospice, retirement community, or other centers of care. This afternoon, I will commune. Um, oh, I remember, what's his name again? Um, um, he, he's, from, he's, he's from Zion, but he, he, he worships here. Um, Rod. I heard. What? I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's up at uh, Grace Point. Any thoughts, you know? Okay, then now the Sanctus and the Great Thanksgiving. Now this is where we get right to the presence of Jesus in, a, in, a, in, in such a rich way. And the story of Jesus is getting closer and closer and closer to us as now the Sanctus and the Great Thanksgiving. It's Palm Sunday. And every time we, we uh, uh, use the Holy Communion for our liturgy, we are all of a sudden right there on Palm Sunday singing Holy, Holy, Holy. Almost suddenly, following the prayer of the church, the liturgy sweeps the congregation in spirit from the life narrative of our Lord in general to experience the events of the Holy Week in particular. Following the invitation to Thanksgiving, the great Eucharistic prayers of the church. <coughs> that was one of the ways where when Pastor Joe wanted me to celebrate with him, um, he had his doctorate, like I said, from the University of Notre Dame in, in, in liturgy, and he really, he was a Lutheran. He didn't know it, and I didn't him it. <laughs> but he, he said he loved Luther's setting of the Eucharist, with one exception. And he said he had it had an inadequate Eucharistic prayer. Mm -hmm. So he was going to write it for me so I could get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but that Eucharistic prayer is where we say, Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore, praising thee and singing holy, holy, Right. Um, so, so again, then, following the invitation to Thanksgiving and the specific praise in the preface, 
the body joins the Jerusalem crowds in the holies and hosannas of Palm Sunday. <coughs> and that's what that's meant to do, to bring us back in time and to bring us back in spirit to join with that Palm Sunday crowd as we join in the hosannas, which, of course, we sing at that point in one of the settings for the the great thanksgiving. Now, Lord, teach us to pray. The plea of the disciples becomes a prayer of the body as we say grace before the meal. In the infant church, the grace and mystery of the Our Father was once revealed only to and prayed only by the baptized. This was a, 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 a at least in my reading of history, a fairly uh, in, the, in the Western Church, a fairly common practice that you did not hear the Lord's Prayer uh, until after you were baptized. So you were baptized, you were immersed, you were immersed into the water, you came out on the other side, you were handed bread and milk and honey, because now you have crossed over into the land of milk and honey, and at the same time, uh, and, and exactly what the setting was, I don't know, but I do know that in many, many uh, churches, after you received, and you received the embrace of the church in so many ways, and then you were sat down and you were taught the Lord's Prayer. Okay, now we say the Lord's Prayer even before, soccer matches and, and but but back then the Lord's Prayer was um, how do you say it just, just, just a, a marvelous gift to the church that you did not know until after you were baptized. But, <laughs> Today in, the, I've written here, today in the prayer has become, for better or for worse, public property. However, in this sacred space, the body of Christ is taught new and drawn together once again, not only in the word of the prayer, but by him who in the sacrament is the word present in our prayer. Thoughts? Words of institution. It's Monday Thursday. Right? We're going from Palm Sunday now to Monday Thursday. We're in the life of our Lord Jesus. The word of institution, Monday Thursday. The Palm Sunday praise and the family prayer must now give way to silence as we gather with the Monday Thursday disciples in the upper room to hear and to ponder words very old, very beautiful, and set in mystery. Take and eat, this is my body. Drink of this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant. And these words, and in this moment of Christ's invocation, if the Lord's table was ever claimed as a denominational property, if the claim crumbles before the infinitely greater reality, and these words of institution. Take a deep, take a drink. This is my blood, this is my body. The celebrant is Jesus, is Jesus Christ himself. The celebrant is Jesus, Lord of the universe, Lord of the kingdom. Uh, so at that point, the, the, the uh, how do you say it? That, well, I think well for you and you, Sebastian, and the elders, uh, this is a special moment. We're busy at that point, you know, bringing the communion. Uh, but at that point also, there is, as I've written here, the celebrant is not you or me or, you know, uh, the celebrant at that point, the one who is giving the bread and the wine is our Lord Jesus Christ. He just happens to use people like me. But, but the one who is presiding over this communion service finally is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The celebrant is Jesus, the 
Lord of the universe, Lord of the kingdom, Lord of the section, truly, eternally risen. The pastor now steps quietly down into his rightful place together with the other communion assistants <coughs> as blessed acolytes, faithful to their Lord and to his body of the church. <coughs> I write that in there especially because uh, uh, at this point, uh, it, it, the, the one who the focus is on in many respects is the pastor and he is a celebrant. But the one who is residing over the Lord's Supper is not the pastor. We are distributing the sacraments, but the one who is bringing the sacrament to us at that point is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The pastor now again steps quietly down into his rightful place together with the other communion assistants as blessed acolyte, faithful to their Lord and to his body in the church. And the on this day, Good Friday, and I was writing this, I guess I was when I was serving at, at Zion, and uh, I would it, it took a while, but everybody would get busy as soon as we were coming to the um, uh, 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 the honest day, Christ, the Lamb of God, okay? Uh, and the acolytes would come up and they'd start getting this part ready and they put the computer rail down, they put the, the, the uh, leaders down and so on. And one time, Marilyn was at the church that kind of bothered me. She said, we are seeing Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, Grant to us and I, and she said, everybody's kind of buzzing around at that point. And we're recognizing our Lord Jesus Christ. Shouldn't we all just be focusing on, at that point in our liturgy, the Christ who is presiding, the Christ who is present, the Christ who is giving us himself? And I said, yeah, yeah. First time in her life she was ever right. As <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Anyway, so I had a long talk with the elders uh, so that we could be sure that we were, however we were doing this preparing and the bread and the wine and the vessels and everything else, that it was done either very quietly or just we just stand there at that point as we sing, um, Crow Christ, the Lamb of God, because that is, well, let me just read it. The Anus Day. It is good Friday, right? So we are going to the communion liturgy from Palm Sunday through Monday, Thursday, and now to Good Friday in the Agnus Day. Perhaps all too quickly for our guests, and perhaps also too quickly even for the regularly gathered body, we remember together beneath the cross the suffering and death of our Lord for us, as the whole body intones the ancient words. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. And that is such a precious moment in the life of a congregation. Right? That is our focus at this point. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. There is a temptation at this point in the body of Christ narrative for ushers, elders, acolytes, and other assistants to become very busy preparing for the procession to the altar. This, however, is deep, holy time, a time for no worship, no movement other than the body's deep and quiet remembrance of her Lord's suffering and death in this ancient prayer, right? Chanted by the unworthy. We are now deep into the theology of the cross, which is not unique with Luther, but summarizes when we pray for sapientia, we just preach only the wisdom of the cross, which is said, and now we are deep into, not exclusively Luther, but where Luther was as good as any theologian who ever did, that the theology of all of our lives are viewed through the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, everyone. Uh, hear me that again. This, however, is deep holy time. A time for 
time for no worship, no movement, other than the body's deep and quiet remembrance of our Lord's suffering and death in this ancient prayer chanted by the unworthy. We are now deep into the theology of the cross, awaiting our Savior's invitation to his wedding feast, the time for quiet reverence and devotion now is clear. Now, uh, again, as I introduced this to me, when I, when I wrote this years ago and included it in my critique of uh, our practice and our theology and our interpretation of, uh, 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 and in our communion practice in the Missouri Synod, which I, which I, I still have a great deal of difficulty with, um, and, and pretty upset about that. And we need to examine and re-examine what the scriptures are saying again about the discerning of the body of Christ. You'll notice that everything in this, virtually every paragraph, is about the body of Christ, not simply about Lutheran Christians. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. <coughs> it is now Easter. The only possible response to the gift of resurrection is to rise as one body, hungry and thirsty for the presence of Christ in his bread and wine. And from his own hand and heart we receive love, grace, peace, and promise, his body and his blood. This is the last place on earth for anyone to be rejected. Here I stand. This is the last place on earth for anyone to be rejected. We have all joined as the body of Christ in the invocation, the confession, and absolution, in the historic Kyrie and Gloria, in the ancient word of the scriptures, in the common baptismal promise of the creed, in the proclamation of the sermon, in the shared experience of Holy Week, and now in the invitation of our Savior Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The story in the sacred liturgy has not yet merely retold by the gathered body of Christ this Sabbath, but reclaimed, re experienced, relived, and renewed for the future body of Christ. Uh, let's just turn real quickly uh, to the uh, uh, page. Uh, yes, yes, on uh, page 160, the service of the sacrament. <coughs> because there's some exchanging of words here, uh, and the community, he starts with these words. The Lord be with you. And what does the pastor at this point do? Praying for those who are coming to the sacrament, right? And the congregation responds by saying, and also. So there are three times in the liturgy where this little ancient kind of prayer, quick prayer, it also signifies that we're going into a new place. <coughs> I'm sorry. A new place in the sacred liturgy. <coughs> we do this right before the college. Ordinary right, the Lord be with you and also with you. Um, and here at the preface uh, to the sacrament. And then when the sacrament is finished, often it will be used once again, the Lord be with you and also with you. And then there is a prayer and the benediction. Uh, so it, it just said, we're ascending, we're getting higher. Um, and as we, as we experience our way through the liturgy, uh, again, the liturgy starts down here where we are as a quote, broken people who are now put back together in the confession and absolution. Uh, and now to hear the word in the sermon, and now the third, if you will, uh, uh, upward, upward, uh, um, um, uh, what would be the best way to say it, the, the 
upward movement of the sacrament, the higher, higher, as we're, as we're going to come to Jesus in a brand new way in the sacrament. And so there is this, this movement in the sacrament from here all the way up to here. There is a practice in the Missouri Synod, and I've seen it often, uh, and that is where the service starts with communion. And there may be all kinds of good um, thinking, uh, whether it's the people who are present or whatever it might be. But the fact of the matter is, after you have the Lord's Supper, everything is going downhill. And, and I say that very intentionally because that's what our worship is doing on a communion Sunday. We are ascending to nothing less than the time of the Lord. Another thing, you know, we can't do this quite so well now, but when I used to come here, we were to come here, one thing I always appreciate, and that is we would greet one another, right? Before the pandemic said, no, you can't do that. Um, and that was special for us at Ascension, and I always appreciated that, but that in some ways made the, the communion itself even more more intimate and and, uh, and and the peace of Christ and that more more um, 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 human in a sense. Anyway, uh, the service of the sacrament on page 160, Lord, you really also lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. And there it is, the thank of the song just became. Um, and uh, again, we have it on page 162, the words of our Lord, and there's two. Um, settings for this, um, uh, and and uh, things like the proclamation of Christ is often to eat this bread and drink this cup and proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Uh, that may or may not be present in the sacrament, but it was, it was last week that we used the prayer of Saint Hippolytus. Right? He wrote that in the third century. And it's just a beautiful expression before we come to the sacrament. And I came across that just a long time ago, and I used it just once since I've been here. But it is the setting again, all the way back to roughly the year 320, I think, something like that. Oh my! Yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> And sometimes you get carried away. I mean, you can't to see this. You're getting up and out of your mind. 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 You're getting up and out of your